When Mervyn Hughes was born in the Euroa Bush Hospital in November 1961, his mum Frida knew he was something special. He was a big baby, he had big shoulders mm -hmm. when he was born. Uh, I didn't believe the matron. She just brought him down, threw back his nighty and said, now look at those shoulders, and they were big. But even his mum couldn't have imagined her bouncing nine pound baby boy would one day become a cult hero, the most famous moustache in all of the land. The working man's hero has blossomed from a big bellied buffoon to one of the world's finest fast bowlers. After the fourth test in England, he has already seized 25 wickets. And in the air, he's gone. Well, Hughes has done it again. What a magnificent piece of bowling. The funny man has become the money man. I'm quite happy to sit in the, in the back seat and let, um, like Craig McDermott was getting the huge wraps over here and, and Shane Warne and, um, you know, most of the other bowlers were getting the wraps. I'm, I'm quite happy to, to, to sit sit in the back and, and uh, let all the other blokes take the accolades because, I mean, that, that really takes the pressure off you because basically no, no one really um, considers you serious enough to take wickets and when you take wickets it's, uh, it's more of a bonus than anything else, I suppose. The real bonus is that Merv has now joined the elite club of Australian bowlers who have taken more than 200 test wickets. That's hard plum. So Merv didn't hover around on, on 200, he's got a 201. He will soon reach his thousand runs as well. Finally, officially recognised as one of Australia's greats. Wow, he's a competitor. I mean, he really does hate batsmen. And I think you have to have a hate. And I think he's always tried to prove to people that he's a fine cricketer. And finally, just because he's got 200 wickets shouldn't really make any difference. Anybody that's been watching the Australian side under border for the last four years knows that Merv Hughes has been one of the key players. Merv Hughes. That's a good delivery. He's taken his off stump with a nice little leg cutter. And people now can't poke fun at him, although they still will, because he is overweight, and they'll still try and make fun of him. They can never take away from him. But he's been one of the one of the three players to ever achieve that. And the other two players that have done it are fair cricketers. Fair cricketers called Richie Bono and Ray Lindwall, but not since Dennis Lilly has a player captured the public's heart. Merv Hughes single-handedly rejuvenated the game with his big heart and great humour. His popularity was best summed up in Billy Birmingham's satire, The Twelfth Man Again. Mervyn Hughes, a magnificent reflex catch to take his hat thing on the Melbourne cricket ground and the crowd's gone wild. The Australian team's gone wild. It's a great day for Victoria, a great day for Australia. It's a great day for the world and it's a great day for the great man, Mervyn Hughes. But Bill Laurie is just one of Merv's devotees. Even the Poms love him. Oh, I love him to death. He's got a smart moustache and I wish I could grow one, but I had to fake it, I'm afraid. I know this looks like I've grown it, but in fact it's a fake one. Why do you admire him so much? Oh, it's the belly, I think. I think it's the belly and the run-up. I can't... <laughs> Somehow I just can't get, get over with uh, watching him. I love it. There his fan club sits watching Merv's every quirky move, bored stiff by their own insipid team. He provides entertainment. He's always something to look at. He's always someone to cheer for. And, like, the whole crowd loves him. And we all, uh, we all shout for him. And right now they're all shouting Sumo. It's the newest nickname. Although Merv keeps insisting he's nothing like the West Coast Eagles full forward. I still don't think I look anything like Peter Simic. And on their right foot kick too. Enough to frighten the children and the animals, I would imagine, if you had one of those stuck up on the wall at home. Wouldn't need a burglar alarm, would you? As a matter of fact, Merv does scare small kiddies. Just ask these two little boys back in Melbourne. Merv is their hairy godfather. When he first came in with the the moustache and whatever, like as soon as they saw him, up until he was about 18 months, just instantly cried. And uh, Merv would pick him up, they'd grab him by the moustache and just howl. Merv would walk out the door, not a problem. What Merv wanted to do was intimidate batsmen. He 
had the bristling mo, the mad stare, the aggression, but his bowling was wild and his run-up so ridiculously long he wasn't scaring anyone. Ex-Test captain Ian Chappell branded him an imposter. Others were just as cruel, but that just stoked the fire in his now famous belly. If you took everything to heart that was ever written about you, I mean, I would have given this game away 10 years ago. I probably would have only played about three or four games for Victoria. But it's just a learning process, and I mean, obviously, you're going to get better with age, and if you don't, you're not going to be around for too long. The Hughes' first test was highly forgettable. He took one for 123 against India in Adelaide. He's just taken his first wicket in test cricket, and boy, that'll be a nice relief for him. After that, Merv was dropped. He was in and out of the team continually before he finally broke through against the West Indies in the summer of 89. 13 wickets in the Perth Test. Big shout on that occasion, Richie. And then after a torrid fitness campaign, he was off to England where he did some real damage. Captain Alan Border dubbed him the fruit fly, Australia's greatest pest. Ever since then, Merv has been the morale officer. I don't sort of go out to annoy people, but uh, if I sort of get under people's nerves, and uh, you know, I mean, why stop there? You, you just got to drive them absolutely crazy. But um, I mean, I, I figure it's a, it's a positive sign because uh, when we're batting, the batsmen are more keen to stay in the middle. They know if they get out, they're going to cop a hiding from me in the room. So you know, it's worked this series. So I think it's a positive, positive uh, contribution to the Australian cause. What you see is what you get. I mean, he's, he's a very he's a very kind guy. He's very loyal to his friends. But uh, you know, in those days, they just they just wrote him off as a larrikin, and now they, they say he's got charisma. So so uh, it's it's funny how the perceptions change. But uh, the man himself just hasn't changed at all. Tony Donamade is one of Merv's closest mates. They've played district, shield, and test cricket together. Tony says while Merv may grow big ears for a laugh at a county game, he has never developed a big head. While Merv loves to dish it out, he can also cop it, especially from the crowd. As we all know in Perth, they, they don't mind giving it to you over there. And there was one guy up in Printerville standing there that was giving it to Merv all day. And uh, but he kept on saying, Hughes, you're a crayfish, you're a crayfish. And I just sort of thought, oh, shrug the shoulders, keep going on with it. All day he went on, you're a crayfish, Hughes. And we were walking off the ground at the end of the day, and Merv had enough. He looked at him, he said, look, mate, he said, I, I, I can understand most of the ones that people call me. He said, but why crayfish? He said, He's got a big red bum and head full of crap. <laughs> despite his antics and despite his sense of etiquette and dress, Merv has proved he's a smart operator. He may still be a boy from the western suburbs, but he's now an international star, although his intelligence certainly didn't show up at school. His fourth form report card was a beauty. The science teacher thought he was going to blow them up. The geography teacher sincerely wished him well with his cricket career. Now, Frida, I believe that your son wasn't that good at school, is that right? In some subjects, the subjects he liked. He, he liked some teachers, he liked a cooking, cookery teacher and he did well with her. Cooking, right. which leads to eating. Merv's gut is now a national shrine, but the boys are on his back constantly to lose weight and prevent those groin and hamstring problems. I mean, you know, we've got a, a very important season coming up when we get home, so, I mean, you can't go too far out of control, so you just try and keep it sort of in within reason. I mean, if I get over 9 and stone, I'll start to worry, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> Still, there is another school of thought. Uh, well, I think he's very smart. I think early on in his career, he made a concerted decision to put on weight. Uh, I remember him in those days, district days, early days, Footscray, um, Merv was a skinny little fella, you know, and uh, would lose balance after he bowled the ball because basically he'd, he'd throw that much into it that, you know, he... he and he had no weight to hold him down, he'd half the time go, you know, pirouetting all over the place. And, and As cricket becomes even more professional, more serious, the crowd is thankful for a bit of Merv's pirouetting and pranks. I'm one for that if you're enjoying what you do, you're going to perform better anyway. So, I mean, if you go out, you give it your best shot and you can honestly walk off the ground and say, I gave 100% today. Um, you can sit down and say, well, it wasn't a bad day. We had a bit of fun, enjoyed ourselves a bit. And, and most, of the, most of the boys do that, but uh, they probably just don't show it as, um, as outwardly as I do, I suppose. As for the big bowler, he's happy to be in the history books, but even happier about taking wickets and winning tests. Go on. Good catch. 
Uh, we all hate Australia, but let's face it, we all love them. <laughs> it, it keeps us, um, keeps us sane, doesn't it?